So, we're going to be talking about life after national curriculum levels. And we're going to be talking about uh, some of the replacements that are out there. And as I was just saying, uh, the last two years I've spent working on this at ARC Schools. You'll see up there I'm Research and Development Manager at ARC Schools. And so I'll also be showing a little bit about what we are doing at ARC. Um, and some of, the, some of the ideas that we've come up with. So the structure for my uh, talk today is as follows. Uh, so first of all, I think you know, we need to talk about what was wrong with levels, because if you don't kind of analyse what was wrong with them to begin with, you might end up just making the same mistakes all over again. So I spend a little bit of time on that. And then a little bit of time then on one possible replacement, which is um, to use questions, to use questions instead of levels. And then a bit of time on another possible replacement, which is comparative judgement. There we go. So that's the outline for today's talk. And then hopefully I'll finish in time for there to be a few questions at the end. OK, so first of all, what was wrong with national curriculum levels? Well, I would say that I think there were, um, there were two main things I would say that was wrong with them. I think, number one, I think they tried to do too much. So they tried to do everything. They tried to be an assessment system that would give you a kind of end of phase sort of level summative grade for the pupil. But then they also tried to uh, be used for in-class formative assessment. So you ended up with that situation, you know, we'd have a lesson and you say, right, well, if you can do this at the end of the lesson, you're a 4C. If you can do this, you're a 4B. If you can do that, you're a 4A. And they were, kind of, they were never designed to be used like that. They ended up being used by that, like that. And actually, you know, you, you can't use those kind of summative grades in that way to sort of, you know, look, look at it in the lesson and see how pupils are progressing. And I think that's a wider problem uh, that all, uh, I think, a lot of assessment in this country has. That we, we, we want one assessment to do everything. And we overload so many purposes onto assessments. The same things happen with GCSEs. So for me, I think a really sort of a basic principle is no one thing will do all the things you want it to do. It will end up actually just doing a lot of things badly. So you're better off, you know, if you've got one really good assessment or one really good idea for something, you know, be very clear about the purpose and just get it to do that well and, and use something else for the other purposes. So in particular, for me, splitting out summative and formative assessment and having different systems for those is a really important principle. So that's one. Uh, the second real big weakness with national curriculum levels is uh, actually I think that they didn't provide a common language. They provided the illusion of a common language. And I think this is really important because for a lot of people, even people who don't like levels, who think there were weaknesses with them, they'll say, oh, but you know, levels, they did provide a common language. You know, that was the one good thing about them. And I would say even that one good thing was not a good thing, actually. It was an illusion of a common language. And that's really, actually, really dangerous. Because if you've got one person using the word cat, and they're referring to it and they think it's a, you know, a four-legged four four-legged, four -legged, uh, four -legged mammal, and you've got another person who thinks you know, that the word cat is referring to, I don't know, you know, a window, then you've got a problem. Because you are using the same word and meaning very, very different things. Uh, so I don't think they did provide a common language. I think they provided the illusion of a common language. And actually, just to illustrate that point and really sort of bring it home, I just want to show you an example of what I mean by this. So uh, here we go on the next slide. I've got um, an example, if you like. It's not from the national curriculum level, but it's an example of the kind of statement that you might see on the national curriculum levels. So here we go. Uh, you can, can compare two fractions to identify which is larger. Now, on the surface, that seems like a, you know, quite a straightforward, quite a precise statement. And if you're assessing a pupil, you would say, right, can this pupil compare two fractions and identify which is larger? You know, that is my criterion for judging whether they've understood this thing that we've, we've done so far. But even with an apparently precise criterion such as that one, you quickly run into, run into trouble. So uh, you could quite easily define that criterion in this term. Uh, which is bigger, three sevens or five sevens? You could also very legitimately define it as this. And you could also very legitimately define it as this. So those are all legitimate interpretations of that criterion. And then what I'll show you next is when those questions were given to a group of 14-year-olds, the percentage of 14-year-olds who got those questions right or wrong. So the first one, 90% of 14-year-olds got that question right. Uh, the next one, only 75%. And then the final one, you might see where this is going, only 15%. So there you've got three questions which are all completely leg legitimate and fair interpretations of the criterion. And yet, when you devise, you know, when you give those to pupils, you get wildly different response rates, wildly different rates of accuracy. Uh, and I think that, again, is why they were providing, you know, national curriculum levels provided this illusion of a common language. Because you might have one teacher coming along going, yeah, all my pupils, they've now fractions, don't worry about it, they can all compare two fractions. Because they're talking about the first one, and you've got another teacher saying, oh, you know, all my pupils are really struggling, but they're talking about a question like the last one. Okay? So, again, this might seem like a, a, a small point, but actually it goes really to the heart of any kind of system based around 
prose descriptions of pupil performance. And just to sort of hammer this home a bit, I'll give you another example. That one I've quoted from Dylan William. This one is from uh, an American one, Paul Bambrick Santoyo. Um, so his criterion is up there, you know, uh, understand and use ratios, proportions and percents in a variety of situations. Well, again, you know, it sounds fairly precise. What does it mean? Does it mean that? And I think we can guess that quite a few people would get that right. Does it mean that? I think fewer would get that right. Does it mean that? That even. And just to labour the point, you know, does it mean this or this? Okay, and that's taken, as I say, Paul Bambrick Santoyo has an entire chapter on this uh, in Driven by Data, which is a great book, you know, I really recommend it. And it's all about, you know, this chapter, it's all about you've got to define the assessment. You have to define what it is you're talking about. And those standards, those prose descriptions, those vague criteria will not do that job for you. Um, and so the problem with national curriculum levels, you know, and I haven't taken these criterion, the two I've given the examples for, these criteria, I haven't taken them from the national curriculum levels. Actually, I've taken... Um, you know, two other examples. But when you look at the national curriculum levels, they have this problem, but more so. I've actually been quite generous here because I've given two fairly precise types of uh, cri criteria. Actually, you know, look, here's a few examples from, from, from the, AP, the old APP grids, the assessing pupil progress grids that you might remember. Uh, you know, one of those uh, is um, in a piece of writing, the main purpose is identified. And then for another level, the, the, the criterion is comments identify main purpose. You know, how are you meant to distinguish between them, to tell the difference between a pupil where the main purpose is identified or where the comments identify the main purpose? Um, and similarly, you know, statements like, comments develop explanation of inferred meanings, drawing on evidence across the text. You know, actually, what does that mean? You know, what does a pupil who's doing that look like? What does one who's not doing it look like? Um, so you quickly, and what you also uh, end up doing, and I've noticed a lot of people doing this as they try to kind of rewrite them, is you end up in a kind of adverb soup. Uh, and if you ever tried to write a set of criteria or write a rubric, you'll end up with this. You often end up, you can write the A star and the E criteria maybe, or the top and the bottom quite easily. And then you're suddenly stuck in this nightmare of trying to find adverbs, you know, what's in between outstanding and fluent or accurate and compelling, you know, and you're just stuck there trying to work out what goes in between. And, and the reason why you get stuck there is because of this, is because they don't give you that precision that we think that you can get from them. Um, and so I would say... Um, I would say probably one of the most demoralising things I've seen then is that a lot of the replacements I've seen for national curriculum levels do just seem to be rehashing this approach to them. So they seem to be rehashing this idea that you can just write something up and then check whether the pupils have met it or not. So if I give you an example of what people did with levels and what they're doing you know, with a lot of their replacements, you end up with something that looks like this. So people set up a spreadsheet where you've got your kind of three sort of, you know, you've got all your criteria across the top and then you end up, you know, you colour code it, you rag rate it, red, amber, green. And you say, well, can I ask and answer questions? Mm, no, you definitely can't do that, you know. Um, can I ask and answer questions? Yeah, brilliant, all the time. Uh, and you can see, you know, what does it mean that a pupil is an amber or green on these things? You know, what, where, where is the meaning in this? And as I say, again, can make inferences when reading text. I mean, and the criteria, the, the criteria about inference is the ones that really sort of annoy me the most because actually, you know, inference is not a formal skill. So the inference ones that are particularly frustrating. But even one like can spell most words accurately. I'm sure, again, you know, many of you will have been in moderation meetings where you're going, well, you know, if they've got a very simple word wrong all the time, but they get everything else right, is that the same as a pupil who gets some really difficult words wrong, but gets the basic ones right? And how do you make those judgments? So I think these require, you know, teachers to be making a lot of these judgments over and over and over. Um, and again, all the research we have on this is that not just teachers, but humans find making judgments like that exceptionally difficult. And I'll return a little bit to some of the research about that at the end, actually, about the difficulty of making such absolute judgments. Um, so hopefully, I've done enough now for you to see why there might be a problem with this kind of criterion referencing, with this kind of pro, you know, these kind of prose descriptors. But then, uh, fair, you know, when I, when I explain this to a lot of people, you know, fairly legitimately, they come back to me and they say, OK, very well, fair enough, Daisy, but what are you going to replace them with? You know, it's all very well to say this, but what should we use? How are we going to track progress? How are we going to monitor how our pupils are doing? We can't just, you know, throw it all up in the air. And they're right, of course. So, you know, let's move on to it. So what can we do to replace them? So I'm saying there's two things we can do to replace them. We can define criteria in terms of questions and pupil work. So just to give you an example, the previous slide, I said this is what a lot of what we do at the moment. We're trying to rag rate against very vague statements. If you define uh, criteria in terms of questions instead, you end up with something that looks a little bit more like this. So a very simple, very basic thing. But instead of having your criteria across the top, you've got your questions. Um, and the questions, it's very simple to say yes or no. 
right or wrong? Did you get that right or not? Okay? And the other advantage of a system like that, I said the other system can also be quite burdensome because it often requires the teacher at the end of the lesson to go through and make a judgment against each criteria. The advantage of a system like this is you can just plug the questions into a bit of software, the pupils can take them online, you don't even have to mark them, and you automatically end up with something like this. And so one of the systems we're using in a couple of our schools at ARC is a system that pretty much does this for you. It's called I Am Learning. Um, and that's something that we're using to give us this kind of formative feedback on how pupils are doing, not against vague criteria, but against questions. And again, I find the sort of demoralising thing is that whilst there are systems out there like I Am Learning which do this for you, there seem to be many, many more which are doing the other type of version and allowing teachers to go in and make the judgement against the criteria. Um, but there are good systems out there, and like I say, I think I Am Learning is one of them. So let's just dwell on this for a bit then. I've said you can define the criteria in terms of questions. I've given a couple of very basic types of questions there. What a lot of people then often come back to and say, well, you know, these kind of questions, you know, aren't they, they can be a bit, they're a bit basic, they're very simple. You know, they're questions with right or wrong answers. Um, and, you know, one argument you often get, well, you know, the kind of answers that people, the kind of questions that people are going to face in the real world often don't have one right answer. And actually, interestingly, um, uh, a, 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 a writer on assessment who, who I really, really like, Daniel Koretz, he's written about this. And he said he was once at a conference where a lecturer made exactly this point. She said, um, you know, in real life, you face problems that don't have one correct answer. And he said, well, okay, true, but actually there's a lot of problems in real life that do have one correct answer. And he said, for example, you know, the pilot who flew that woman to the conference, he had to decide when he was landing the plane, you know, whether the flaps should be up or down. And there's a single correct answer to that, and, you know, thankfully for the lecturer, the pilot made the right decision. Um, and similarly, he said the lecturer came up to him at the end of the conference and talking about it, and, and she said uh, she couldn't remember the name of the, the reservation of the, the hotel that they were all staying in, the, the name of the hotel they were all staying in. And he said, well, there you go, there's another question with one right answer. Um, and apparently she walked off in a huff. Um, which is perhaps understandable. Um, but I think you can see what I'm saying, that there are questions in life which do have one correct answer, uh, and they can be often very hard and very challenging. And uh, you know, to follow on from that as well, I think one particular type of sort of closed answer question which has got quite a lot of uh, opprobrium in the past uh, is multiple choice questions. So multiple choice questions often, you know, they're a very rare example of something that often traditionalists and progressives in education both agree on. In that traditionalists tend to think they're very gimmicky, a bit Mickey Mouse. I, uh, I know my father, he says, oh, I'm very American. You know, and that's a big term of uh, criticism, you know. Um, they, you know um, and, and then you'll get a lot of progressives also say, well, you know, they're very soulless, they suck the joy out of teaching. Um, you know, that's not, um, it's not, it's not, it's not what teaching's about. Uh, but actually, when you dig into the research behind this, you find there is an awful lot of really good research evidence about the value of multiple choice questions for a number of different functions. So uh, let's have a little look uh, at some of that. So uh, Dylan William, uh, you know, well-designed selected response items can probe student understanding in some depth. So they can give you, uh, uh, you know, they're not just about the simple, the simple questions. Just because there's a right answer doesn't mean it's an easy answer. It can be a very challenging answer, which is very challenging to answer. Um, Robert Bjork, who's also written a lot about multiple choice questions, he's a big fan of them. He does say also that maybe one of the reasons why they've got such a bad rep is they're hard to do well. So he says this, he says, achieving proper construction of them, um, which requires that the incorrect alternatives are plausible, but not so plausible they're unfair, is a challenge. And that is true, and anyone who sat down to write a set of multiple choice questions will know that. You have to come up, obviously you have to have one of, your, one of your options has to be right. The ones that are wrong, you have to think very carefully about making them plausible, but still wrong, and still unambiguously wrong. And that's a challenge. Uh, so, you know, you have to give a lot of thought to them. But I would say one of the kind of advantages of them too is that we, uh, compared to essays, with multiple choice questions, you put all your work in up front. So you spend a lot of time thinking about the question and thinking about the possible options. But then the work is done and they're very, very easy to mark and you can reuse them. With essays often, it can be relatively straightforward to set an essay question, but then all the work comes after the fact when you have to mark the essays. And every time you set that essay question again, you have to mark all the questions again. So I think multiple choice questions do require a lot of work, but it's upfront work, it's very efficient because you can reuse them. Uh, so that's one thing you have to think about. And the other thing you, have to, you can think about too is when we were looking to introduce some of these at ARC, you know, a few people came back to us and they said, well, you know, can't people guess them? It's very easy to guess them. And okay, you know, there's a one in five, if you've got five options, there's a one in five chance of guessing the right answer. But then if you have ten questions, 
you know, actually it's going to be very hard to get all 10 right just by guessing. But we took this on, we took this seriously, and actually, again, Dylan William had a very inter interesting suggestion about this, if you're worried about people's guessing multiple choice questions. And he suggests this. He says questions that have more than one correct answer basically make it harder for pupils to guess. It increases the challenge. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. And again, this is something we've done at ARC this year. Um, here is a question with one right answer. Okay, so there's just one option there. And again, a criticism of multiple choice questions is the pupil, they get that question, they realise the first answer is right, they circle that, and they don't even bother looking at all your other carefully constructed alternatives. You know, they find the right answer, they move on. But then if you say, right, I'm not going to tell you how many right answers there are, there could be more than one right answer, and you give them this. So there might be one right answer, there might be two, there might be three, there might be four, there might be five. So they've got to study and carefully read all of them. And I think that does increase the challenge. And I would say we used a lot of these type of questions again at ARC this year, and what we found was actually they're really challenging. And uh, often sometimes they can be too challenging, you know, you need a lot of time to go through them and really work them out. So we ended up settling on a little bit of a compromise. We would tell pupils the number of right answers. So we went with something like this. There we go. Um, and then just to, to think about the, the sort of uh, what we're talking about here, the chances of guessing, if you're worried about pupils guessing, Here's the chances of guessing if there are five options. So if you set up a multiple choice question with five options, if pupils don't know the number of correct answers, there's a one in 32 chance of guessing. If they know there's one correct answer, obviously one in five, and then you can see the others are sort of, uh, if it's, you do two or three, often that can increase the challenge, but still be, still be quite, um, still be you know, understandable, not, not, too much, not too much of a burden. So that's something to think about if you want to use them. That's a little tweak, something you can do in multiple choice questions to maybe make them a little bit more challenging, a little bit more interesting. And then, as I say, the advantage of it is, is that you can then kind of plug those into a nice bit of software uh, and get some really useful feedback come back to you. Um, so it's a nice way of doing that. Obviously, what I've given you there, you might say, well, that's a relatively straightforward question. It's also in maths. You know, people will say, yeah, I understand how you can use multiple choice questions in maths and in science. What about English? What about history? You know, can you use them in English and history? And I would say, yes, you can. And you can use them for more than just a simple, you know, what year did this happen in type of question. And so coming up next, I've got a couple of uh, really good multiple choice questions, which I've taken from the leaving exam in British Columbia. Um, and it's, you can access these online. They're freely available. Um, and I think they have some really nice questions. They have a paper of multiple choice items and they have a paper of, uh, you know, essay, essay questions. And these multiple choice questions, I think these are designed for 17 year olds. I think it's their leaving exam. So let's have a look at some of them. Here we've got coming up uh, an English one. This only has four options. Okay, so which characteristic of elegy written in a country churchyard can be seen as romantic? So I think this is a really nice question. I think this is not something you could kind of, you know, rote learn the answer to. It is something that forces you to stop and think. Uh, I can see from the furrowed, furrowed brows and looks of concentration on your faces that it is all forcing all of you to think. Um, and I think you have to know quite a bit to be able to answer it. You have to know the poem, you have to know what romantic poetry is, you have to know about a lot of those concepts in there. So I think it is a nice question. Um, so that's, again, I hope an example of something. You can see that the question can be very, very challenging. So I'll give you one now, um, I'll give you a history example, I've got quite a few here and I know they do take a lot of time to dig into and think about, so I don't want to bombard you with lots of them. But here's a nice one, and this is a nice pattern one that you could take away, I think, and use very easily in history. Which is an example of a cause and effect relationship, this is also from British Columbia. And I think this is lovely because you could see how if you just change the distractors, you could use that question a lot, couldn't you? Whatever, if any of your history teachers, whatever you're teaching, you could easily you know, set that up and change the distractors. And what you need to know there, you basically need to know about all of those events in the distractors, really, to get that right, you know, to reliably get that right. So I think that's a lovely one too. It's obviously an interwar one. Um, and then I'm going to put up my favourite one now, also from the British Columbia leaving exam, uh, another history one. It's this one. I've written about this quite a bit. So, uh, how did the Soviet totalitarian system under Stalin differ from that of Hitler and Mussolini? Now, what I like about this question so much is I really love one of the distractors. I think one of the distractors is really clever. I think C is a really clever distractor. Uh, it made trade unions illegal. And why I think that's a clever distractor is, 
I think pupils will think to themselves, ah, you know, people with a superficial understanding of the era will think to themselves, ah, Soviets, that's communism, you know, they, they like trade unions, so they won't have made trade unions illegal. So the pupils with a superficial understanding, I think, will plump for C. And then you'd get some really interesting kind of insight from that. And that's just my, 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 my guess, though. I haven't seen any data on this question. But I think, well, hopefully, what you're seeing there is an example of a very, of a very sophisticated multiple choice question, which is really tapping into some higher order skills and understanding. So those are some from the British Columbia Leaving Exam. Um, I'll whiz through some others. I won't spend a lot of time on them, but um, Macmillan Publishing offer a lot in their resources online for undergrad students. They offer quite a few. Here's one from an economics textbook. I'm not going to dwell on that. I'm not an economist, but you can see it looks pretty hard to me. Uh, the next one's from um, the GMAT. The GMAT is the American, um, the American Business School Entrance Exam, and they do a reading paper and a, and a maths paper. And the, I'll, I'll dwell on this for a bit just because the structure of this one is quite interesting. They do a chunk of writing and then some questions on the writing. So you have to read the writing and then answer some questions. And that's a great structure, I think. And uh, about a year ago, I went up to Cambridge, I went to the Cambridge Assessment Archives. Uh, I can see Tom Oates in the, in the, uh, Tim Oates in the, in the um, audience and he recommended it. And I went and looked up, um, they, there was an exam that the Oxford and Cambridge Board offered for about 30 or 40 years, it was called Use of English and it was for sixth formers to use if they wanted to pass it, if they wanted to, to get into university. Um, and it had a multiple choice paper that was quite like this. You read quite a challenging paper and then you answered multiple choice questions on it. And when I looked into the archive, they actually had some of the statistics about that paper and they showed that they had a very high correlation between the multiple choice element and the essay element. And generally that is something you will find with most multiple choice questions of this type. There'll be a very good correlation to other indicators, but as I've just shown, uh, they're much cheaper, uh, much, much cheaper and easier and more efficient and quicker for you to mark. So you kind of get the same outcome, but a bit quicker and a bit easier for you. Uh, so another GMAT example, a maths one. Um, and finally, one from, we've used this year with some year seven pupils at ARC. This is a nice one. Um, they had to read a passage from Oliver Twist um, about um, Bill Sykes, and it was referring to uh, the phrase savage resolution, which was contain contained in that passage. So it was accompanied with the passage. Um, so there you go, whistle-stop tour through a bunch of multiple choice questions, which I hope, I hope have uh, maybe overturned maybe some of your preconceptions about them. Uh, I've focused a lot there on the value of them, if you like. I think they can be very valuable summatively. I think they can be very valuable um, for giving you that summative uh, grade, but they can also be va of value formatively. So let's look at this one. Uh, if you set up the distractors to be very clever and you put in a common misconception, then you can get some really great feedback. And I would say that's true of all the questions I've just shown you as well. That, you know, if people are putting certain answers, you're getting great feedback from that. So let's have a look at this one. Um, what is 20% of 300? You've got the correct answer there, but you've also got a very common misconception. So my maths teacher friends tell me though, the common misconception is pupils think when there's a percent sign that you can then divide by the percent. So they think that 20% um, of 300 is 300 divided by 20. So that's why 15 is up there. So 15 is kind of the common misconception where you're trying to see have pupils really understood percentages or are they falling into one of the very common errors that pupils often make. Um, and I think that one comes about because you're often told, you know, with 10% you can divide by 10. So they think, oh, 20% I can divide by 20. Um, so if you get that coming back, you know, you've, you, you know exactly what you've got to do to work on. So summatively and formatively, they offer a lot of value. And as I said, you can end up with your nice, if you're worried about monitoring, tracking progress, you know, your senior leaders are coming to you talking about that. Well, you know, something like that, tracking progress. Um, obviously, you know, you'd have 10, you'd have all the pupils, but it looks a bit like that. And that can be a really effective way of tracking progress. Okay, then. Right, so I've spent quite a bit of time talking about my first option for uh, use it for replacing national curriculum levels, which is questions, multiple choice questions specifically. But then people, again, quite legitimately will come back to me and say, OK, fair enough, we buy your argument on multiple choice, but you still can't get rid of essays, and nor would you want to get rid of them. Pupils still have to write essays, we still have to mark them. Surely when you mark an essay, you need a rubric. And then you fall back into all the problems I've talked about, about writing rubrics. Um, so this is an important question. You know, what can we do? How can we mark essays uh, more reliably? How can we mark essays and maybe not get bogged down into some of the uh, adverb soup I've talked about? So let's have a look. 
Uh, normally when we're marking an essay, you know, we'll often take the essay and the way that you're kind of encouraged to work is you take the essay, here's your essay, you take your lovely criteria, look there's some lovely I can statements, don't we love them, I can produce work that has a beginning. Um, <laughs> great, you're a level three. Um, <laughs> And normally you kind of look at it and you say, right, here's my criteria, here's my, uh, here's my essay, does this essay meet it? And often, and, and this style of criteria really encourages that, often you go, you know, you, you're encouraged to take a very tick box approach. So does it have a beginning? Yes, tick that off. You know, does it do this? Yes, tick that off. And you move through and tick things off. Um, and actually, you know, that's a really, I think, you know, and I'll come to the uh, evidence on this, that's a really terrible way of marking. And, and I think for any of you who have done this, you'll often notice when you do that with the first essay, you then get to the next few essays and you're like, oh, no, actually I got that first one totally wrong. Because actually when you're marking, really what you're doing is you're not comparing essays against criteria, you're actually in your head sizing up where all the essays are relative to each other. Um, and actually that's a much more effective and more reliable way of doing it. But I think we've got into this way now of thinking, you know, you have to just match something up against the rubric and if it doesn't, you know, completely fit one of the tick boxes and it can't get the top grade, even if it's a fantastic essay. And similarly, a very tick boxy essay can get a very good grade, even though you know deep down it's not actually a very good essay. So I think that's an issue there. Um, so I would say instead of doing this, so normally we ask, does this essay meet the criteria? Uh, instead of that, I'm going to say what you should do is you should ask yourself, look at the essay, look at another essay, ask yourself, is this essay better than the other essay? What's a better essay? And if you do that enough times, and you have some nice software, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, you, get a, you can get a very, reliable, uh, uh, a, a very reliable grade out of that, a very reliable series of grades. Um, so I think you can use this approach a bit more, even if you don't have the software I'm going to talk about. But I'll move on now, I just want to you know, talk about um, some of the research that underpins this idea of why it's hard for us to mark against criteria. Because I think a lot of you might be thinking, hang on a minute, you know, I mark my essays against criteria, what are you talking about? Um, but as I say, I think you know, actually when we're marking more often, we do have this framework in our heads of, of kind of other essays and the standard they're at. And so what I want to show you is why human judgment, it's not, it's not a point about teachers here, it's a point about humans and how our, how our minds work. Uh, judgment is comparative and relative, it's not absolute. Okay, so I want to give you an example of that now, it's taken from the paper below. Uh, so in this academic paper below, uh, they gave a group of people uh, three actions and they said we would like you to rate the following three actions on a scale where one is, you know, fine and ten is evil. So I'm not going to ask you to do it in public, but I would like you now, if you've got a pen or paper, you can do this for me please. So here are your three things. Um, so please, uh, for all three of those, Give me a number between 1 and 10 where 1 is fine and 10 is evil. Okay, and just do that yourself. I'm not going to put anyone on the spot and ask them. But you can see what you come up with. Um, and then, so the researchers in this paper, they did that with one group. They gave those questions to one group. And then they gave another set of statements to another group and asked them to do exactly the same thing. And they were these. So I'll give you a minute to have a look at those. And now I suspect, you know, the, the keen beans amongst you will have jumped to the conclusion here, which is that three and three star are the same. It's the same action. But the two groups who were given them, group one regularly give three a higher rating than group two give to three star. So group one all say that poisoning a barking dog is kind of more evil than group two do. So why is that? It could be that, you know, group one was full of animal lovers, but actually, you know, they've done this enough times, and, and, and I think you can see where this is going, is that when you are thinking about poisoning a barking dog in the context of stealing a towel, it feels awful. It feels like, you know, the most terrible thing in the world. When you are thinking about poisoning a barking dog in the context of killing human beings, you know, you think, okay, well, you know, maybe I need to put the human beings being killed up at the top of that scale and then pull the part, you know, barking dog needs to drop down a bit. Okay? So I think what you can see there is um, we make judgments, they're, they're relative. You know, we make them in comparison and in relation to other things that are happening and to anchor points that are happening. And that this is just one, you know, quite famous experiment, but there's been lots of others done in this same field. And I'm sure you can think of things in your life too where, you know, 
when you, when you have a comparison or something relative coming in that it, that it changes your mind. And this is true of essays. And it's been, it's been shown to be true with essay marking too. The essay markers are kind of systematically given the sort of a bottom end of, 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 of marks. You know, they will actually tend to want to try and use the whole spread of marks and the pupils who are at the top will end up you know, getting sort of higher grades. And similarly, to, uh, people are always marking essays from the top end. The pupils at the bottom of that will often, will often um, you know, end up end up getting lower grades than they actually deserved. Um, so I think that's a, um, you know, that's another thing that's been studied in relation to marking too. So hopefully, what you can see there is just trying to illustrate how human judgment is comparative and relative. As I've said, it's not absolute, and that's the reason why marking against criteria is so tough. So as I've said, we should be marking in, in, in comparison and in relation to other essays. So I think the way you can do this in a low-tech way is to always, when you're setting essays, have exemplar essays to structure moderation meetings around a comparison rather than you know, nitpicking over statements on the criteria. Um, so that's the low-tech way of doing this. The slightly higher-tech way is to use a really good system, um, which is it's called, it's called No More Marking, um, and it, it is free to use. Uh, here we go, comparative judgment with no more marking. I'm giving a plug here. This is uh, another, 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 another organisation. It's uh, run by Professor Chris Weedham. No more marking. It's based at the University of Loughborough. Um, you'll see that um, I think Ofcore have used it recently to do some to do some judgments with it. It's essentially, as I say, what it provides you with. It's, it's a software engine. You upload your essays, and it then presents them to you two at a time, and you have to say which one's better. And if you do that enough times, you put up three, you know, you can have three, four, five markers doing it. If you do that enough time, essentially the algorithm in the system, it will come back with kind of the rank order of those, of those pupils. Uh, I haven't used it myself, we haven't used it at ARC, we're, we're hoping to this year. I have been a marker for it, a trial marker for it, and it is really interesting. You just get the two essays come up side by side, you just got to pick which one is better. And it's surprising, actually, how easy it is. <laughs> uh, and like I say, if... Um, if you get five of your teachers doing that, you know, you upload your essays into this engine, you get five or six of your teachers sitting there, they do that for half an hour, you'll then have a, a much more reliable kind of order of, 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 of your pupils than you would get, I think, in any other way. Um, so I think this is a really promising new approach. I'm really, really keen on it. And I suspect, you know, in like 10 or 15 years' time, it will be really, really dominant. I think we'll be using it a lot more. Um, and so, yeah, because I'm such a fan of it as well, I, I did also say that to Chris that I would, I would plug a new uh, event that they're doing uh, in fact, I'll just show you this, actually. Um, I would go onto their website. They've got this great game on there called the Colours Game. So if you're sceptical about what I said about poisoning the barking dogs, go and do this. And this illustrates that point really beautifully. And it's very simple. So have a go. Go on there and, and do that. And then, uh, if you are interested, um, they're running an event at the Royal Institution on the 12th of October. So the link's there. And I'll, I'll put these slides up on my website. You can get those. So... Um, I've taken you, as I say, on a whistle-stop tour through uh, multiple choice questions, comparative judgments, uh, replacements to national curriculum levels. So I will just sum up then my conclusion, what have I told you? Um, don't replace levels with rehashed levels. You know, you may as well just stick with levels. Save yourself the work of going through the thesaurus, right? So if you're going to replace levels, you know, strike out, try and do something new um, that isn't just rehashing them. Uh, and then define criteria, I would say, in terms of A, questions, and B, pupil work. So you've def defining it in terms of pupil work is basically the comparative judgment side of it. And then thirdly, I would say, you know, just keep in mind whatever system you're coming up with, human judgment is comparative, not absolute. If you're setting up a system that requires teachers to make, you know, hundreds of judgments against vague criteria, you're, you're setting them up to fail. Uh, so that's my message for you today, and we've still got, I think, about five minutes for some questions. So... Let's uh, open the floor. Questions? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, just sort of question about yep. the, the uh, yep. name or marking kind of idea. Yep. I was just kind of playing that through to kind of think about my own teaching and students. So would you say that would be useful information for me as a teacher? So I would mark my essays to probably still, which I would probably be quite keen to do. Um, Mm -hmm. but almost it's a way of tracking relative position in a class, why people might stay in a certain place, and, yeah. and obviously it provokes my thinking about why I judge these particular essays to be better. Yeah, I think that's definitely one thing. And, and obviously you make a very good point there in that with essays, you still want to give the formative feedback. So you still want to read them and, and make a comment. Um, and so, yeah, what no, what no more marking or comparative judgment can offer you is it can offer you the rank order, as you've said, so you can track that over time. If you put some exemplar essays into the mix, it can also give you a grade. 
So if, say, you've got 20 kids in your class, you take 20 essays, you put those into the engine, but say you take five essays, which you've kind of pre-marked and pre-agreed, these are five essays at certain grades. So this is an exemplar, A star, A, B, C, D, or whatever. Then you'll be judging those at the same time, and you'll be able to see, you know, you'll get the rank order of your pupils, but at certain points you'll get where the A star, A, B, C, D come out at. So it can also give you a grade, if, if you want it to. But it, and, it, and it can give you that relative judgment too. As I understand it. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you make a good point there. Um, and for me, that kind of sequencing of learning should come from a well-planned curriculum. And then the assessment should, should kind of feed into that. And the, 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 so the, the, the link between the assessment and the curriculum kind of does have to be there. So I agree with you about the importance of, of sequencing the learning. And, and, and you're right, there, there still does have to be, you know, if you're writing the curriculum, the curriculum has to be composed, if you like, of some of those abstract statements. I think the difficulty we're in in education at the minute, it goes back to that point I said at the start about the illusion of a common language, is I think we're in a situation where you know, we have a lot of words flying about that don't really have a very precise meaning. Uh, and if you look at other fields where you know, they do use abstract criteria and use them in a more precise way, it's because they've been um, precisely defined, not through kind of dictionary definitions, but actually through, um, and I mean the, the person I, I, I sort of lean on here is Thomas Kuhn in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. That, um, one of the things he talks about is what, what is the function of the problem sets at the end of a textbook, in a science textbook? You know, why do you need them if you've got the, the, the text there? And he says, well, the reason why you need them is actually, you know, you have people who can read all the text and get to the end of it and not be able to solve the problems. And his argument is that um, scientists become inducted, if you like, into the paradigm of their profession. They become inducted into the paradigm through those problem sets, not through the text in the textbook. Now, he's not saying get rid of the text, you still need the text. But what's happened is the problems at the end is what, uh, are what give the text meaning. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, if we define criteria in the way I'm talking about through questions, the questions as a whole will come to give the criteria meaning. The criteria on itself won't provide meaning. You know, people will still be able to read them as they do with Kuhn's science textbook and not be able to appreciate that. So I think it's a difficult one, um, and you're right about the importance of the abstract nature. I guess what I'm trying to say is, we, you know, the abstract stuff on its own won't, won't do the business. <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> Tim. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree with that. And I think that was what I was sort of trying to do when I said they're so hard to write. And having kind of written a lot of them this year, um, I mean, some, ones around the apostrophe are very interesting. Um, in that you're always trying to, you know, tackle those really common misconceptions. That you're, you, you know that pupils make the it's and it's error, and you're trying to work out, you know, where exactly is it that they make it, and to put in things, you know, that, that are going to really get to the heart of that. And, and, and so when you do that, it is not easy to create them. Um, because you're really thinking, as you say, Tim, about the construct, the underpinning construct. Um, and, but as I say, I still think whilst they're hard to create, they're almost a learning opportunity in itself. You know, they're good for you as a teacher and they, they're good for the pupils. And as I said too, you can reuse them. So you can reuse them over and over. But yeah, the underpinning construct is what you should base them on. Yeah. What are the chances of multi-choice ever becoming part of GCSE assessment? I can see I have one, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I heard a rumour the other day that someone had sort of suggested it and it had been sort of shot down by one of the exam boards. And, you know, they proposed a paper. I think, as I say, there is a big kind of cultural sort of um, bias against them. And as I say, I think the thing that makes it particularly hard 
is uh, it's traditionalist and progressive, if you like, you know, so I say everyone. Um, and so I think it is hard. And if there's one thing I've learned over the last few years in education, it's, you know, the sort of entrenched uh, power of, uh, of the sort of, you know, the, the, sort of the, the, the conventional wisdom. It can be very hard to break down. So I'm not holding out any hope anytime soon that examples are going to suddenly get them in and start using them. But I think, as I said, whilst they offer a summative function, they offer huge value formatively. So I still think, you know, even if the examples never come around to it, we can start using them in the classroom. As I say, we've done it at ARC this year. Your kids really love them. You know, you see them scrambling away furiously, having arguments about the answers, which is just great to see. Um, so I think, you know, even if the examples don't come around to it, we can still make the most of them. Yeah. Yes, Joe. Mm. So, yeah, a great question and kind of goes to the heart of what I was saying right at the start, that the government have the idea of like a school-led system, school-led reform. And I would generally say, you know, if the government, you know, sort of want to scale things up, actually the best way might be to sort of stand back and let the schools who are doing this uh, innovate and, 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 and try and get those good ideas out there. Um, in terms of ways the government can help, I think comparative judgment, I think for some of the examples, I mean, off call have already used it. I think there's a real role for us kind of off call to use it more, example to use it more, for that to be kind of better known. Um, and as I just said in the previous question, you know, I think the chances of exam boards starting to use multiple choice questions, uh, you know, I'm, I, as I say, I'm not holding my breath, but there's probably relatively little I think government can do here. I think it is something where it is about the, the, the ideas and the profession, it's about what we do as teachers, so probably, um, you know, m maybe in some, if there's some sort of experiments they can do or they can fund certain experiments with comparative judgment or whatever and publicise some of those, that would be good. But in terms of big policy movements, um, probably, probably not so much. I think, you know, yeah, letting, letting schools and, and groups of schools and teachers uh, push things forward, I would say, hopefully, would be the right idea. Great, I think I need to finish there because it's about 22. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.